Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to GNR Central and today I want to talk about a band that I haven't discussed a whole lot on my channel and that is Velvet Revolver and in today's video we're going to talk about how the band actually formed in the first place. Now we all know that the band formed in 2002 but we have to go a couple years prior to that to really look at the early days of what caused Slash, Duff and Matt to reunite. Now by 2001, Slash's Snake Pit had disbanded for the second time and Slash started working on a new project with the Black Crows drummer Steve Gorman and an unnamed bassist on the new project. So they began to write music for what would become Fall to Pieces that would appear on Velvet Revolver's first record, Contraband. At the same time, Duff McKagan reformed his band Loaded, a band he had previously played with for his tour in support of the album Beautiful Disease with Jeff Redding. McKagan would also add Mike Squires and Jeff Rouse to the lineup, and following Loaded's tour of Japan in 2002, they also added Wasted Youth former guitarist Dave Kushner to the lineup, who would join Loaded in place of Mike Squires. So, when musician Randy Castillo died from cancer in 2002, Slash, Duff, and Matt would perform at a benefit show to help raise money and commemorate Castillo, along with Josh Todd and Keith Nelson of Buck Cherry, as well as Be Real and Send Dog of Cypress Hill. Here's Duff McKagan talking about how they actually reunited and the feeling they got from playing together again after probably four years of not having shared the stage together. What was the process of putting that together? Was it kind of a happy accident or did you seek out to put these people together? I, uh, um, some things happened in my life and I, and I got sober and, and I had to sort of rethink everything. I'd never, I hadn't um, kind of walked a sober day for 10 years and and so that took me a couple of years to figure out and I was just doing things for like one minute at a time and, and I figured out that I, I I could do anything was possible when you know you know you're gonna live <laughs> like okay well and I, so I there was a, a friend of ours Randy Castillo a drummer had, had passed and uh, there, there was they were gonna have a, a benefit concert in LA it was 2002, I think. And they, um, Matt Swarm came up with the idea of slashing me and him playing for this benefit and having Stephen Tyler play and sell the place out and raise money for Randy's family. Uh, there wasn't money left for some funeral costs and whatnot. So it was a no brainer. Yeah, well, of course we'll do it. We'll do the gig. And it's Stephen Tyler and it's killer, you know? And uh, that was really the first time three of us had played since. I guess, you know, 94, 93, 94, sometime. And it just felt right, you know, so, uh, so we kind of pursued it a little bit, started writing some songs and got Dave Kushner in the fold and wrote more songs and Wyland came in the fold and boom, we were off to the races. So following the benefit show they did for Randy Castillo, Duff, Slash, and Matt started to realize that their musical relationship and their chemistry was still intact after years of not playing together. And then they began to start rehearsing with one another and they also brought in Josh Todd and Keith Nelson of Buck Cherry and they started working on new material that would become the song Dirty Little Thing that would also appear on Velvet Revolver's first record Contraband. But they eventually decided against forming a group with Josh Todd and Keith Nelson. So during a loaded show at West Hollywood's Viper Room, Duff McKagan introduced Dave Kushner to Slash who were previously friends in junior high and high school. Now Kushner was invited to jam with the group and was soon invited to join with Slash stating Dave brought a cool vibe to what we were doing and there was no deliberation and that was it. It was a perfect fit. Their former Guns N' Roses bandmate Izzy Stradlin also joined them for two weeks to start writing songs. Now at this point they hadn't found a singer yet and at one point Izzy suggested that maybe him and Duff would, would sing for the band and they would just do a club tour in a van. Slash stated that in his autobiography and he said it was hard to tell whether Stradlin was serious or kidding. The band would start to audition singers and they auditioned Kelly Schaefer of The Atheist and Neurotica. Around that time Stradlin would leave the group for good and while Schaefer's audition was unsuccessful, the quartet continued auditioning for a lead singer with VH1 filming the recruitment process while also not having a name yet for the band, they would just call themselves The Project. The resulting documentary was aired as VH1's Inside Out, The Rise of Velvet Revolver. 
you guys can go find the actual documentary on YouTube, and it's a pretty good watch if you guys haven't seen it before. So a number of lead singers auditioned for the band during this period, including one familiar face, which included Todd Kearns, who slashed his current bassist with the Conspirators, as well as Sebastian Bach, formerly of Skid Row. Now, Miles Kennedy was also brought up during the audition process, but he ended up declining an invitation from Matt Sorum to join. Ian Asprey of The Cult and Mike Patton of Faith No More also declined audition offers. So the band were also interested in auditioning Stone Temple Pilots singer Scott Weiland, who had become friends with McKagan after attending the same gym. It was also revealed during a 2004 Howard Stern interview that Matt Sorum and Scott Weiland attended the same rehab program together and first met that way. So Scott Weiland was eventually got in touch with and he was sent two discs of material and felt that the first disc sounded like Bad Company Gone Wrong. When he was sent the second disc, Weiland was more positive comparing it to core era Stone Temple Pilots, though he turned them down because Stone Temple Pilots were still together at the time. So when Stone Temple Pilots disbanded in 2003, the band sent Weiland new music, which he took into the studio and added vocals, and the music eventually became the song Set Me Free which was really the first song that Velvet Revolver released, and it was used for the Hulk soundtrack. Now, Wyland was still unsure whether or not he wanted to join the band despite delivering the music to the band himself and performing at an industry showcase in the Mates rehearsal studio. In fact, Scott Wyland almost failed to show up for the industry show, and here's the clip from the documentary where you can see the tension building between the band until Scott finally shows up. Yeah. Good game. Oh, there you are. How you doing, man? All right, looking looking forward to seeing you. All right, see ya. So Scott will be here in an hour. He'll be here in an hour. About About three there. now, almost three. He has four or five. He has the flu, but he's feeling better. Yeah, he's feeling better. I mean, I don't know what to do. I mean, I we can't can't start out like this, can we? No. Dude, we got all the heavies coming. All all these huge movies. Scott was really excited. Well, it was you know, Scott, you gotta be there by twelve. Oh, well, twelve rolled around. One rolled around. Don't get excited, don't ever. Get excited. <laughs> what time are those people coming? Two o'clock. Two o'clock rolled around. That was our first time we'd have it invited the industry. And if Scott didn't show up, that was going to put a year's worth of work into some serious jeopardy. So, you know, my anger was pretty founded. What he was doing in those two hours, who knows? But he showed up, and he nailed it. That was a close call. I'm, a, I'm more relieved that he showed up when he showed up than even what the people thought of it. Because right. it was really hair-raising. Yeah. Right. yeah? All right, ciao, man. Thanks right. a lot. Now, even though Scott Wellen was still unsure whether he wanted to join the band, they, of course, recorded Set Me Free, and they also did a cover of Pink Floyd's Money for the soundtracks for the movie The Hulk and The Italian Job, respectively. Soon after that, Wallen would finally join the band, and Set Me Free would manage to peak at number 17 on the mainstream rock charts, really without any radio promotion or a record label. And it was prior to a screening of The Hulk at Universal Studios that the band chose a name. After seeing a movie by Revolution Studios, a slash like the beginning of the word, eventually thinking revolver because of its multiple meanings, the name of a gun, the subtext of a revolving door, which suited the band as well as the name of the Beatles album. Now, when he suggested revolver to the band, Wallen suggested black velvet revolver, liking the idea of something intimate like velvet juxtaposed with something deadly like a gun. They eventually arrived at Velvet Revolver, announcing it at a press conference and performance showcase at the El Rey Theater, while also performing the song Set Me Free and Slither, as well as covers of Nirvana's Negative Creep, The Sex Pistols, uh, Pretty Vacant, and Guns N' Roses, It's So Easy. So that does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Now, were you guys following all the news that was going on with the project or Velvet Revolver dating back to 2003? Or was it something that you guys became aware of later on after Contraband came out? Let me know in the comments section below. And be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. And go check us out at GNRCentral.com for the latest Guns N' Roses news. Take care.
Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses, and you're watching GNR Central. Yeah! <laughs>